Welcome to Financial Repression Authority's Roundtable Insight, where the best fund managers, economists, and industry leaders discuss the key investment issues and challenges in the current macroeconomic environment. Hi, welcome to FRA's Roundtable Insight. This is Richard Bernoulli. Today we have Charles Hugh Smith, America's philosopher, we call him. He's the author, leading global finance blogger, and he's the author of several books on, on our economy and society, including a radically beneficial world, automation technology, and creating jobs for all, resistance, revolution, liberation, the model for positive change, and the nearly free university in the emerging economy. And recently, Path Finding Our Destiny, Preventing the Final Fall of Our Democratic Republic. His blog of twominds.com is one of CNBC's top alternative finance sites. Welcome, Charles. Thank you, Richard. It's always a pleasure. Great. Uh, I thought today uh, we'd do a focus on the Federal Reserve uh, that's been in the news, uh, you know, quite quite heavily uh, in recent weeks. And uh, even today, uh, we're talking on Wednesday, July 10th here, and um, just wanted to to do a focus on uh, how everybody has an obsession. Um, the market itself has an obsession with the Federal Reserve as being essentially the sole driver of higher valuations. You know, is this healthy or, or not? It's essentially financial repression taken to an extreme. I just did a podcast yesterday between David Rosenberg, Ira Harris, and Peter Bookvar all three who frequently appear on CNBC and Bloomberg. And we had a very similar discussion on the very similar theme. Even David Rosenberg thinks that uh, it's going to be very extreme on what the actions the Federal Reserve will take, essentially going towards uh, zero interest rates, more and more QE, and ultimately debt monetization, where the Federal Reserve buys whatever debt that is issued by the Treasury. And so on that uh, theme, uh, you've graciously provided some some charts, uh, one of which is, is showing how the federal government expenditures has been going through the roof asymptotic and, and resulting in, in deficit uh, spending essentially. So that, that will all continue, but, but essentially the message is there that the Fed is there as a backstop. It's there to do the monetization, outright monetization of, of whatever debt is needed. Your thoughts? Yeah, thank you for that um, excellent summary of the situation, uh, Richard. And I guess my first uh, response is just to go back a bit in history. And I have a chart here of, of the last three bubbles um, in the uh, um, S&P 500 uh, going back to the, the uh, 1990s uh, dot-com bubble, which burst, and then the uh, mortgage housing bubble uh, in uh, the late 2000s, which burst, and now the uh, so-called everything bubble. And what, I, what strikes me about this, um, as you say, single-minded obsession with uh, Federal Reserve policy, like what's the latest easing gonna be to push valuations higher? That strikes me as um, what happens at the top of, of, of equity bubbles, right? Because uh, when, when um, the market seems to be relying on one driver and obsessing uh, solely on that, that seems to mark a top. And when I, um, I, when I think back to the 1999 um, NASDAQ bubble and the dot-com bubble, there was, of course, the underlying sense that the internet was going to be growing for decades, and so you know you couldn't go wrong investing in internet companies. But there was also like a, an almost comical obsession with something called the book to bill ratio, which was a measure of of orders uh, compared to current billings in the semiconductor industry. And the semiconductor industry was sort of a proxy for the entire tech sector at that time. And so uh, you'd, you'd see these huge swings in equ equity valuations across the entire tech sector, not just semiconductors, based on this week's book to bill ratio. And so it was um, laughable even then how focused the market was on one indicator, right? Which as valid as it might have been in, in, in some circumstances, it was like the whole market was 
being swung up or down by this one indicator. And then in, in the mortgage uh, housing bubble of the late uh, mid to late 2000s, um, 2000, you know, five, six, seven, then we were told, well, you know, housing never goes down. And um, it, it, while people were interested in what the Fed had to say in terms of the effect on, on, on mortgage lending rates and so on, the obsession was really with, you know, how fast real estate's appreciating this month. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I kind of, I guess that's part of what I feel is, it feels extremely fragile here is this, this obsessive um, concern with, with Fed policy as the only thing that can possibly push markets higher. So that means higher profits, higher sales, um, innovation, um, you know, higher uh, wages. Um, it's like none of the things that actually make a healthy economy um, are of any concern. And that should trouble us. Yeah, it is. And it's, it's almost perverse because uh, as you can see in the announcements of labor statistics, for example, uh, the market is keenly looking to the, those statistics as a driver of monetary policy and ultimately affecting equity valuations. So, so that if, if the labor statistics are bad, uh, then there's a sense that the Fed will be pumping more, uh, easing more, so therefore the markets go higher. On the other hand, if the labor statistics were good, uh, then that would translate to, oh no, the Fed is not gonna give us that drug, and so you know, you, we won't get it, so therefore equity valuations go lower. So it's just totally crazy and perverse. Your thoughts? <laughs> Yeah, and um, I'm glad you brought that up because in terms of labor uh, statistics and, and uh, you know, whether wages and, and earned income is rising or not, I have a chart here that shows uh, workers' share of the national income. And it, what's really striking is it's um, been in decline since the um, turn of the 21st century here in the U.S., and so in this period in which the Federal Reserve and other central banks have 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 made the greatest expansion of, of um, quantitative easing and the greatest expansion of central bank balance sheets and, and massive financial repression to, to keep rates near zero. Um, it hasn't benefited people with, that depend on earned income, which is the vast majority of people, right? I mean, certainly the bottom, say, 90% of households, their, their wealth is, is based on their income, not on, um, you know, their, their um, equity uh, ownership. And so it's been a disaster for the bottom 80 to 90% of households, and it's only benefited the top uh, 10%, of which the vast majority of that is actually goes to the top 5% and, and uh, top 1%. So it, it, it hasn't benefited um, the the uh, economy as a whole or society as a whole so that you're right it's just massively perverse and even then it's it's very fragile um, the whole system as you can see on your chart for all sectors debt securities and loans liability level there's that little blip in the financial crisis that just seems to be um, a hiccup but it caused massive financial crisis you know, globally and uh, it, things are just getting worse. Uh, we're, we're going higher and higher on a, on a swimming pool plank with less and less water and, and more and more <laughs> instability. It's just, uh, it's just crazy. Your, your thoughts? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that chart up because um, this is total, total systemic debt, basically, you know, public and private, and it's pushing 70 trillion in the U.S., um, and GDP is around 21 trillion. So it's over three times GDP. And it's, and what's really frightening, um, is, is the, uh, the rate of increase, you know, that it's, um, from that little blip in the 2008, 2009 crisis, uh, total debt was about 55 trillion and now it's 70. So we've added, you know, uh, $15 trillion at, very quickly. And there doesn't seem to be any any uh, reduction in the rate of that debt uh, accumulation and um, this 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 rapid rise in debt across public and private is is sort of mirrored by the um, the rise here in federal uh, federal expenditures um, 
which also uh, this chart I have here from the uh, St. Louis uh, Fred database um, shows uh, federal spending it also uh, had a little hiccup, um, you know, right after the recession. And it was, um, and, and then it's uh, resumed, it's, it's uh, in a very fast increase. And so the federal government is spending 4.7 trillion a year and taking in roughly a trillion less in, in revenues. And so here we are f floating another trillion a year in, fe in, in federal debt um, in so-called good times. And then, of course, we have to add in that state and local governments are also borrowing a lot of money they, uh, in terms of municipal bonds and um, and that kind of debt. And then there's private and corporate debt. So um, is this a healthy economy that's so dependent on debt and then therefore dependent on central banks dropping interest rates? Um, I mean, you know, what, how would you say in terms of financial repression, everybody knows the positive effects of, of the Federal Reserve dropping interest rates, right? But what about the negative effects? We, nobody seems to talk about that. I mean, there are negative effects, right? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's in all different aspects, the economy, the financial markets, social implications, uh, widening income, wealth inequality, resulting from all this and uh, we're rapidly approaching what central banks uh, can do or, or, or have have the capability of doing. Uh, there's other charts as well that can show how more and more debt is needed for an incremental increase in economic growth and that that is that is getting bigger and bigger more, more and more debt needed for just a slight amount of economic growth and uh, and that's in the economy, and then in the financial markets. If we look at the bond market, more and more of the of the major central banks are getting into the situation where they they may be the only buyer, the the, the only the last and only buyer. Um, and you know, we look at, for example, uh, Bank of Japan. That that's been the case already for for quite some time. European Central Bank is essentially there now. And the Fed is approaching that situation as well, and those those areas are uh, it, it, it's a pretty uh, dire situation. If you have the point where only the central banks are buying, uh, it's you know it's basically uh, there's there's no market for that. Your thoughts? Yeah, it's it's interesting. It's um, I call that that mechanism a perpetual motion uh, machine. Um, in that, you know, the uh, the Japanese model and and uh, what we referenced, what you referenced earlier in our in our talk, um, that uh, David had had said, um, when the central banks are going to monetize debt, then it's like a perpetual motion machine because, well, the you know your your national government can uh, borrow a trillion dollars and and spend it, and um, then your central bank buys those bonds and um, and they basically vanish without a trace into the central bank balance sheet. And um, there's no cost to society um, in the sense that the, the Federal Reserve returns much of its income uh, to the treasury. So it, it looks like it's like, well, there's, there's nothing wrong here. I mean, why couldn't the Federal Reserve just go ahead and, and monetize $2 trillion a year in deficit spending and uh, just let the balance sheet go from four trillion to, to to twenty trillion or thirty trillion, and um, and and of course a lot of people are looking at Japan as the model for this, as as they've more or less gotten away with this, <laughs> you know, yeah. and 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 everyone says, well, you know, the trains still run on time, and Japan is still a wealthy nation, and everything works, and so why not monetize debt and just let your balance sheet go crazy? Who cares? And so it's hard to answer. Uh, it's hard to come up with a reason why that doesn't work, because Japan seems to be proving it does work. Yeah, I mean, essentially, there's a there's the two lever situation with debt, right? So that you have uh, the quantity of debt and then the interest rates. So as the interest rates have gone down through financial repression, it's allowed governments to to go on a debt binge. Uh, 
essentially for, for more and more debt, uh, much more debt now than we were at the financial crisis, for example. Problem with that is that is very high levels of debt. And as the interest rates creep up ever so slightly, it becomes higher and higher servicing costs. And that could get out of hand. Uh, so you could be boxed in, you know, in terms of what governments can spend. Um, your, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that's a great point, um, Richard. And of course, in Japan, I, uh, I try, every few years I try to keep track of um, what percentage of, the, of their central government's tax revenues go to just pay the interest on their enormous sovereign debt. And I believe it was 40%. Um, now, this is at, at interest rates of basically 0 0.01 or less, right? I mean, you couldn't get, you, you know, you really can't get any, any closer to zero than, than Japanese uh, sovereign debt. And yet it's, it's already consuming 40% of their tax revenues. So you got to, you know, and that's, I'm just uh, saying that as an example of, of the mechanism you're describing that eventually, even at, at a tenth of 1% interest, you get boxed in because uh, it's, you're uh, just servicing that debt um, makes it more difficult to take care of the rest of your social and government spending. And so, so um, and of course, the other downside is no one can earn any money that, that, uh, safely, right? The only way that anybody can earn money um, is by speculating that the central bank is going to lower interest rates below zero, so that your bond uh, that you that you bought that it's paying 0.01 percent will in, go up in value because now the now the rate is minus 0.5 percent or something. But you, you know, in terms of like safety and um, safe returns on investments for insurance companies and pension funds and so on. Mm -hmm. That's, that's also been basically destroyed, right? I mean, it's um, for people that are much younger, um, they may not remember that back in the seventies, um, the, the uh, it was a, it was a uh, regulation that uh, savings and loans would pay five and a quarter percent interest on your savings. And so that was actually fairly hefty. Um, and now, of course, it's impossible to earn uh, five and a quarter percent safely. You know, you're, you're taking on enormous risks in, in buying junk bonds or uh, corporate debt that's, that, to get that. And so um, I think that's another element of fragility, you know, as well as the size of debt in getting boxed in by the debt. We're also boxed in because everyone has to gamble now in highly risky, dangerous um, asset markets in order to earn some sort of return. It's crazy. It's unsustainable. And wh where do we go from here? What, what is the way out? Another theme yesterday that was discussed is essentially inflating. There's, there's only essentially one way is to inflate the way out uh, to, to make that burden of debt um, less, less burdening. Uh, by increasing the inflation rate uh, to high, much higher levels. Your thoughts? Right, right. That's what a lot of us have been anticipating. And, um, of course, we know uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, governments uh, understate uh, inflation. We think the real-world inflation is, as you and I have discussed many times, running more like 6 to 7 to 10%. Um, instead of the 2.1 or whatever the official rate is. But um, yeah, we're, we're, we've all been anticipating that. And I think what's interesting is there, there, there's got to be a deflationary element in the, in the system that, that um, has been offsetting the, the, uh, the inflationary impacts that should be registering um, in, in terms of deficit spending and, and money creation and so on. And so, um, you know, it could be that, uh, like, say, going back to Japan as an example, that deflation is a factor in Japan because their um, their workforce is shrinking, so there's less consumption, and there's um, so there's fewer drivers to, to to push up real estate and equities. There's just fewer workers, and so then you get deflation in in consumer prices than in assets, and then you you also have a huge overhang of bad debt from the uh, Japanese. Um, 
uh, bubble of the late 80s. And so as, as loans are defaulted and, and get written off, then that's also deflationary. So uh, it makes me wonder um, what happens when you've, when you've, uh, if you don't have any deflationary impacts, then, then we might get a, a inflationary shock if, say, the, the federal government decides to pursue, uh, you know, modern monetary theory ideas of, you know, huge stimulus programs, uh, universal basic income. And, you know, the, we can bandy about numbers in general. It's like, maybe a, a limited universal basic income would probably add about a trillion to uh, federal spending. And then uh, it's pretty easy to add a trillion more in, in um, infrastructure and other fiscal spending stimulus. So um, if you're going to create and push out $2 trillion a year in a $20 trillion economy, I think maybe you will finally get inflation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's if you look at one of the great thinkers in the Austrian school of economic tradition, I was talking with Ronald Peter Stovall of Incrementum a couple of weeks ago. Uh, he wrote the book on Austrian school investing, and he pointed out that Murray Rothbard uh, has uh, the view of the the three phases of inflation. He was one of the great thinkers in the Austrian school, and uh, he says, first, we look at the monetary inflation. So we've had that. We've had a lot of that. That then goes into asset inflation. Obviously, we've had that and still have that, uh, a lot of that. And then the third phase is consumer price inflation. So it eventually all comes into consumer price inflation. So that 8 to 10% a year, roughly, where if you look at uh, the Chapwood Chap uh, index of inflation that more accurately measures inflation than any other index, including government statistics that uh, indicate eight to 10% uh, per year inflation in most of the US cities, that uh, that is likely to, to get higher as, as time goes on. Your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so it's, I'm glad you, you, you brought up Rothbard's you know, work in that because a lot of people, I think, have been lulled into a false confidence that uh, we can basically create essentially endless amounts of new money or credit, and there's never going to be an inflationary impact because we've gotten away with it for 20 years, um, or in the case of Japan, 30 years. But um, that, that's, um, that may be a false assumption. You know, I want to mention a social impact here that um, – you know, when we we talk about finance, we have to remember too that um, there's a social impact to this kind of financial repression of mm -hmm. jacking up asset valuations um, with with quantitative easing and, and super low rates. Um, and so, I, you know, I spend some some of my time in the San Francisco Bay Area, and um, as we all know, there's many real estate bubbles. Uh, well, where where you are in Canada and Vancouver as well, and uh, the West and East Coast, many West and East Coast uh, cities in the US are reaching just absurd levels of housing valuations. And so like approximately 5% of the population in the San Francisco Bay Area can afford a house there. And of course, this is a, an area, a region with very high um, incomes. And so say the top 5% uh, income in the, in the Bay Area is some um, I believe it's north of 400,000, where in the rest of the U.S. it's more like 250 or 300,000. So you have to make really enormous sums of money in, to, to afford a bungalow right. <laughs> in the Bay Area. And so uh, there was just a, uh, what's the net result of this socially as well as economically? And, yes. um, and so this, what, what one social result was there was just a poll uh, that was uh, – published in the San Jose Mercury News um, that said 60% of millennials in the San Francisco Bay Area, and there was people around 30 or under, uh, want to leave or plan to leave the Bay Area in a few years. Wow. Because there's just no point in staying in a place where you have no future, where you're mm -hmm. going to be struggling to pay the rent, and that's it. You'll never afford a house. And they had um, – 
they had a young couple that had scrimped and saved and worked two jobs and so on and bought like a little bungalow for 700,000 a few years ago. And they, uh, their quote was worth uh, thinking about because they said, we're working at 150% to, to maintain a lower middle-class life. Mm -hmm. In other words, it wasn't like they were really getting ahead. Um, and um, so that's the social costs of central banks pumping up assets in order to please the own the current owners of all these assets, right? Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think that that's going to cause uh, social disorder on a massive scale at some point. Yeah, and also have a feedback loop into the whole problem to making it worse because if you've got this this effectively a brain drain happening. Uh, as well as some level of wealth drain as well, you know, a, a, as the millennials leave from some economic activity representing that. Uh, and this is not just in the Bay Area. I, I see it here in Toronto. I've, I've, there's lots of articles and charts showing it for all over uh, that, uh, in particular, uh, by the way, with Chicago and Illinois, what's happening there, uh, the millennials will not likely be as idealistic as as they've been portrayed, but they, they will leave. They, they, they will begin moving out. Uh, and this will make the whole problem worse because then there'll be more draconian financial repression, uh, higher levels of taxation, and, and just making the whole thing you know wor worse and so on and so forth and cause more and more people to, to drive out. So, so that social problem and effect that you just mentioned could get worse. Your, your thoughts? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's, um, uh, as you say, a feedback loop. Um, I just uh, got a, an email from a reader in uh, Chicago, since you mentioned Chicago, and he said his property tax has gone up by 48%, uh, partly from valuation, but partly from higher rates. And so he says, I don't know how many, uh, how many people can withstand this kind of yeah. increase, you know, and that, um, yeah, it's... Um, and then, and then, uh, you know, the the Federal Reserve we were talking can can monetize uh, sovereign debt, right? The the Treasury can issue a trillion in bonds, and and the the Federal Reserve can buy that. But what about real estate? There's you know the roughly fifteen trillion in real estate, uh, private real estate in the U.S. Is the Federal Reserve going to start buying houses in Chicago to prop up the house uh, values there? <laughs> And so, and in other words, I guess my point being that the Federal Reserve and other central banks have a pretty easy mechanism for propping up equities and bonds because they can just uh, monetize the, the bonds, the debt, and um, they can just print money and buy the stocks, right, as per the Swiss uh, central bank and so on. But um, if the, if the vast majority of, of people's assets uh, in the middle class are, are in their house. And so if the housing bubble pops, um, then what's the Federal Reserve going to do? Well, they're going to lower interest rates uh, to try to create negative mortgages where, you know, if you take out a mortgage, you'll end up getting paid. <laughs> I'm not sure how that's yeah. going to work. Great. But I, I guess my point is I think we're, they're really pushing on a string if you, because you can't prop up all asset bubbles everywhere without um, basically, as you say, destroying any, any notion that there's a market there at all. And so where does this all end? I mean, we're, it seems like it's a lot of doom and gloom. And uh, may, maybe we can end on a positive note from your, your uh, recent book on pathfinding our destiny, preventing the final fall of our democratic republic. What, what ideas and concepts do you put that come from that book that uh, can apply to what we've discussed um, in terms of a positive way out or a potential positive outcome? Uh, what changes need to be made to the Federal Reserve or to the economy, financial markets, uh, in your view? Yeah, well, thank you for that question. I, I think the, the core uh, concept here that a lot of people realize uh, or, or share uh, an, uh, the, the idea that this is the way forward would be to decentralize uh, capital, decentralize banking, decentralize political power, uh, 
and um, so that that would render the economy and the financial sector much more flexible and uh, so that you could have in, um, in, in uh, Nassim Tlaib's uh, conception, you'd have a more anti-fragile economy and, and a financial system because you'd have a lot of variation um, in there because it, it, was, it was freed to be a market again. And so if we had, say, a thousand uh, banks instead of five or six, and then, you know, um, that would be a way forward, I think. And if the Federal Reserve, it, it's almost impossible to imagine, but um, we can at least dream of it returning to its original purpose, which was simply to be the lender of last resort um, in financial panics where there would be a liquidity crisis. If the Federal Reserve could return to that role and stop being the, um, the, the prop under equity uh, values, um, we, could, we, could, we could restore the flexibility that's inherent in markets and decentralized political and economic control because then you can respond to local conditions and um, losses when they are you know, created can be taken without um, putting the entire system at, at the risk of collapse, which is what happens when you centralize capital control and banking. And so that, that's really the ultimate risk we've created here is we've centralized everything and made it much more fragile. Wow. Great insight in uh, how we, we can possibly get out of this uh, from your recent book. How can our listeners learn more about your work, Charles? Yeah, visit me at oftwominds.com. There's uh, several, uh, there's free chapters of all my most recent books. So you can uh, read the, the first couple chapters for free and see if they're of interest. And all my archives and, and uh, essays are free. Great. Thank you very much, Charles. We'll do it again. Thank you, Richard. The FRA Roundtable Insight Show is for informational and educational purposes only and should not be considered as a solicitation or offer to purchase or sell any securities. The investments, investment strategies, and investment philosophies discussed or presented on the show each involve their own unique risk factors which are not discussed on the show. Any discussions among the panel participants or responses to listener inquiries are based on the personal opinions of the panel participants and do not take into consideration the listener's suitability, objectives, or risk tolerance. Please be advised that you invest or speculate at your own risk. Thank you.